Hi everyone, great to see you. Lynn Madden here. So tonight, what we want to talk about is agility course running, reality lines versus fantasy lines. So I'm not sure how many of you actually think of the lines that your dogs take. Some of us just run the agility course and hope that our dogs are able to follow us along and go between obstacles. But do you actually drill down and have a look at how your dog is performing those obstacles? And does it match with what you think they do in comparison to what they do uh, in real life? So what we're going to cover tonight is basically what do we mean by the dog's line? What is a fantasy line and what is a reality line? What is physically possible for our dog to do? And how we can use this information to make better plans on course. So first up, I'm hoping all of you have heard of the three C's. And if you haven't, what we mean by the three C's are basically connect, commit and cue. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because the three C's are at the very heart of our one mind dogs method method. It's what we do between every obstacle to make the course easy for our dog to read and help create the dog's line around the course. So it is at the very heart of what we want you guys to be thinking about. So basically between obstacles, I want you to think about first connecting with your dog, then committing the dog to the line and the obstacle you want them to take next and queuing where they're going next. And if you can do that in between every obstacle, then your dog shouldn't have any questions about where they're going on the course. And in that, that means that they're able to read the line you want to create for your dog on the course. So what do we mean by the dog's line? So basically, the dog's line can be thought of in two ways. We think of it in terms of fantasy land, which is how we think the dog can take the obstacles because we, we tend not to think too much into the physics of how they're doing it. Um, and we just think, okay, they're just going to jump the jump and follow me. And so sometimes we tend to think of that in terms of a little bit of fantasy land about how well dogs can turn and how tightly they can turn and how quickly they can respond to our handling. Then there is the reality of what actually happens on course. And until you actually film yourself running your dogs and have a look at how your dogs really turn and how big a takeoff point your dogs have, all of the, the things and factors that go into how the dog sees the jump, takes the jump and then moves on. And that's the real life of what the dog's line can be. So first thing I'm going to do is play you a little video from Yanita and she's going in depth into what's fantasy and what's reality. And so if you have a look at this picture quickly before we go into the video, you can see she's marked on the ground here um, where she has the reality line, which is this line here and then also has the fantasy line, which is this line here. So I want you to just have a think to yourself, how many of you thought your dog might actually be able to take this fantasy line when you're thinking about course walking, thinking, oh yeah, my dog's just gonna come here to here. And how many of you are actually thinking about how the dog takes this line? So I'm just going to play this video and we'll come back after that. So you can see there, Yunita's done a really good job of predicting her dog's path. And as you can see there, she's talking about the correction strides after jumping. So this is a handler expecting a fantasy line from the dog. So you can see the fantasy line there. She still can't get the dog onto this fantasy line. And so she's having to correct, correct, and to try and get that, the dog then takes an off course. So 
So what we want to think about when we're talking about fantasy lines versus reality lines is in reality, the dogs will take a correction stride after they land. And so that correction stride determines where they're going to end up after they take the jump. And so you can see here after this correction stride, which is what she's going to run now, the dog actually ends up a little bit wider and then corrects into the obstacle that she wants her to take. And so if this is the fantasy line we're trying to predict them to take, you can see after she's landed, which is out here, there is no way she can see this obstacle if she's trying to get her to take that fantasy line. So in that case, when they're trying to handle that sort of fantasy line, then that's when we get off courses, drop bars, um, slipping of the dog trying to turn because they're trying to turn too tightly than what they're capable of. So that's just the very, very basics of fantasy lines versus reality lines. And we'll dive in deeper in these in the emails that we follow up with. Um, but that is the fundamentals of what the dog's path is. So it's the path that you create between the obstacles and where they're going. And so that's where we want you to be thinking about how to create your dog's line and how to make that path as smooth as possible. Now, in order to create the dog's line, we really need to know what our dogs are physically capable of. And so one of Unita's favorite sayings are dogs are not bananas. They cannot, where they take off from, they cannot bend their body around and land in a, on a turn. And so basically where your dog takes off from, a straight line over the jump will be where they land. So the only way that we can improve where they're going to land is by changing their takeoff zone. So in order to do this, we need to understand takeoff and landing zones. And so I've just got a little video here about takeoff point. And so you can see here, I've got blue markers there and then meter intervals. And so I'm just running my dog in extension because that's what you need to do for your dog to understand their takeoff point is having your dog run in extension and looking at their takeoff point and their landing point. And so here you can see rain takes off about two meters and lands two meters. This is my other dog Stormy, a fraction shorter. And she's about a meter and a half is her takeoff point to her landing point. And so this is really important information to have because this takeoff and landing point of our dogs are what we need to know in order to understand how to create the line they take. So if your dog's running an extension, they're going to land. So if it was rain, the first dog, they're going to land about um, two meters past the, past the jump and then have to turn. And then that was in extension. And so then also you want to be able to look at how your dogs wrap. And so I have a video here of Rain and Storm, who are two very different dogs and how they take off and land. So you can see Stormy there. She takes off on quite the slice when she's trying to wrap. And so she's going to land out quite wide. And you can see there she's trying really hard to turn and she actually rattles the bar a little bit. So you can see it in slow motion. She takes off on the slice and then has to really work hard to get up and over the bar. Then if you look at my other dog, Rain, she actually squares up really naturally to the jump. And so you can see the difference in her takeoff point. And where she lands makes the wrap much easier. And you can see as well my position. I end up much further in front of her than I do of Storm simply because she is wrapping really easily. And 
squaring herself up quite naturally. So you can see this in conjunction. So you can really see the difference in their takeoff spots. And I'm doing nothing different in my handling except what the dog does naturally there. And so not all dogs will do that natural square up. And so in the emails, I'll be adding some information in there about how we can teach our dogs to square up a bit better. Because if we want to change where the dogs take off from, then we need to look at changing um, changing that takeoff spot. And so to do that, we want to think about how we can influence the reality line of our dogs. Now, in order to do this, there are a few things we need to take into account. So this is all about where you can create your agility toolbox. And it really comes down to having an understanding of you and your dog. So the first thing you ne really need to understand is how your seven handling elements all work together. And so if we quickly think about the seven handling elements that we use in our One Mind Dogs philosophy, it's motion, which is number one, followed by position, connection, chest, feet, hands, and voice. And so we use all of those handling elements to tell our dogs where we want them to go. Now, in the emails that we have coming up, I'm actually going to add, and Nikki's adding it now into the comments, a link to the seven elements webinar that we did earlier this year, which will really give you a deep dive into how those seven handling elements work in telling our dogs where we want them to go. And then the next step is to understand the lines that each of the handling elements creates. So if you know where the course goes, you then have to think about the line you want your dog to take, whether it's a slicing line, a wrap, um, how they enter and exit the jump. And then you need to have a really good understanding of each of the handling techniques so that you can choose the one that's going to create the best line for you. Now, we do have some really good guided courses on these. So we're running guided courses on um, each of our handling elements, just teaching it on one jump and then adding it into a sequence so that when you understand how each of the handling elements work and how you can add them into a technique, you can then practice the different handling techniques that we have. And so once you start to build these layers in, you can then start to think, excuse me, about how your dog can physically jump and how well you can influence that. So say for a dog like Rain, who in that last video when they were, she was wrapping, can wrap really easily, then she's the sort of dog that doesn't need a lot of help when, when I'm asking for a wrap. Whereas Storm, who takes off on the slice, there are certain techniques I can use like handling techniques such as a reverse V set or um, a, a V set that can really help change where she takes off from that will then help where she's going to land. And so this is what we mean by choosing what works best for your team. So both of my dogs have been trained the same way, but they're physically very different. And that way I, I do need to know what's going to work best for each of them and then be able to apply that to help our dogs make the best choices on course and get their lines working well for them. So we have a couple of videos to have a look at. So I just want to take you into a video that I did of one of the uh, little maps that we've been doing in, our, in my current guided course on advanced backyard setups or ba advanced backyard techniques. And this is the, the map and the students who did this that uh, really got me wanting to do this webinar tonight because everybody had so many light bulb moments when they did this. And then after we have a look at the map, uh, we're going to show some student videos that um, graciously let me uh, share some of their training so you can see the differences. So I'm just going to play this video now. So here's an example of what we're doing in our guided course with the reality lines lesson. 
here you can see that the initial sequence was one, two, coming through the middle to three. And so most people have decided that the dog's path was going to basically come through here, land somewhere out there, and then come through the gap here and look similar to this. Now, what we found was for most people, the dog's line initially started pretty nicely. And then for the majority of people in the first rep, the dogs actually went quite wide here and then came in more like this. And that was the line that they created. And so when we talked about different handling techniques that they could use here to change the different pathways, then we were able to get the dog's line to be more along the lines of what they thought reality should be. However, we had them coming through here. This was all really nice. Then we were able to get them to turn in quite nicely here and then also tighten this line up here. And so basically what we had was what people thought the reality of their dog's line was, what the reality of their dog's line was when they first tried the sequence, and then we concentrated on the different handling techniques to try and get a, a really nice line through here for the dog that was safe and fast and clean. Because what happens, generally speaking, is for the dogs that came right out here, when they came back to try to take this jump, it was a really difficult angle and quite a few dogs were knocking this bar. And then when we tightened this line up here, it put them on a really nice approach to this jump. So I have a few videos to play to show you some of the students when they work through this technique. So we're now going to have a look at Laurie and Spark and they did this map and this was them doing the course. So you can see Spark ended up quite wide and then it was a really shallow into the jump and so on this second one you can see we added a bit of extra collection and that allowed him to turn much tighter through the gap there and have a better approach to that first that second jump and then we tried a different technique this was the japanese just to see if it would try something different which again worked really nicely so I'm just going to play that again so people can see. So you can see on the first go, he landed quite wide and had to come and really work his way back in. So you can see landed really long, has to do the correction stride and then come back through the gap here. And then you can see, if I can get the timing right, how much harder it is for him to take off when he's that close to the obstacle. Now, if we have a look at the second go, much tighter turn. So he knew before he's jumping that there was a turn coming and you can see he's inside the orange rope and already coming through the gap. So he's much easier and able to prepare to take that jump on the second go. And so that was with a false turn. And now we're trying this with the Japanese, which is slightly different technique, but still creates the same line that we're after. Now that was a big dog. And so, as you know, big dogs and little dogs do take the obstacles differently. And there's a lot of difference in the amount of strides they take. So Irene was um, brave enough to let me share her video with Brandit. And this one, you'll see there is a huge difference from the first rep to the second rep. So. So 
So this is the first rep when Irene and Brenda tried this. So you can see she's doing it with a false turn. And yes, you can see how wide he turns there. And obviously how hard that is for him to come in to take that second jump. And then we worked on some different techniques and actually working on showing him some really heavy collection here so that he's able to prepare the turn and take a much shorter path through the gap and look at the difference in the amount of time that that, that makes. And so we're just going to run that one again. So you can really see how wide just based on not showing a huge amount of collection. And Brent is a dog that really does like to do everything at 100 miles an hour and he, he loves his extension. And so we just had to really work on showing him some nice collection. And it's amazing the difference it makes when you really concentrate on your seven handling elements and understand what's needed to help him create that line. And so when it comes to the seven handling uh, or reality versus fantasy, these are the, the main keys I want you to take away is that understand your seven handling elements. Understand what your dog is physically capable of doing. Um, knowing what are the best techniques to create the line that you're after. And then also knowing what works best for you and your team. So there are so many things that go into that, that I really want you to start to really focus on because a lot of us are running around when we're doing agility, not really concentrating on how our dogs are taking off and how they're landing because we're just doing the handling thinking, okay, we need to do a side change here and get to this point here. But I really want you to start to think about where your dog takes off from, where are they landing? How much correction stride do they need to do? What is the line into and out of the, the obstacles? And once we start to do a bit of video of ourselves and our dogs running, then um, you can really start to focus on how your dog takes the jumps and how your dog turns and what's best for your dog. Do they wrap better or do they slice better? Um, all of these things will work into creating your own agility toolbox. And the one thing that we really focus on is that not every solution suits every team. And so we have over 30 different handling techniques that we teach at One Mind Dogs. And that's because every dog is different. Every team is different. And so there is a different solution for everybody. And so really, what I really want you to take away is to embrace those differences. So on those two examples you saw between Spark and Brandit, they're two very different dogs, but they both had the same type of problem by extending too far past. And we can, by working on the techniques that work best for each of those dogs, get them to tighten their lines up. And so what I want you to take away from today is that learning your dog's real reality line will make helping them read the course seem like magic. And so if you can concentrate on the three C's, know your seven handling elements and understand how the different techniques help the line of the dog, you can then really start to understand how to make that course easy for the dog to read. And that's our most important job in agility and as a teammate for our dog is to make the course easy for them to read, show them where we want them to go early and with clarity so that they have no questions about where they're going next. And if we can do that, then 
it's going to make a really nice and fun time on course for you guys. So hopefully you've taken some good messages away from tonight and there will be lots of follow up in the emails to follow um, and lots of examples. And remember, you can always send in videos to us at support at One Mind Dogs so that we can help you out if you're having any issues with this. But I really encourage you all to go out and video yourself, have a look at your dog's reality line and see if you think it is the same as what you're thinking in your mind. What's your fantasy line and what's their reality line? And let's see if we can get their reality a little bit closer to fantasy. So thank you so much, guys, and I look forward to hearing from you all again soon.